Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for the 32nd webinar in the Offshore Wind Series, Learning from the Experts. I'm Cheryl Huber, Senior Project Manager on NYSERDA's Offshore Wind Team, and it is my pleasure to be joined today by, by today's experts, Jonathan Frazier and Jeff Stewart with the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, also referred to as BESI. Before I introduce our speakers, a few reminders for participants and some background on this webinar series. Next slide, please. Firstly, if you're experiencing any technical issues, please contact Sal Graven, Graven at the email address on the bottom of this slide. This webinar is being recorded and the recordings and presentation slides for all webinars in the Learning from the Experts series are available on NYSERDA's website at the address on this slide. All participants have been muted. We will have time for Q&A following the presentation, so please use the Q&A function to submit your questions for the speakers. Next slide, please. New York State is working to advance the responsible and cost-effective development of at least 9,000 megawatts of offshore wind by 2035. Offshore wind is a critical component in achieving the state's goals of 70% renewable resources of electricity by 2030 and 100% zero emissions electricity by 2040. While offshore wind has been providing clean energy to other parts of the world for several decades, this industry is brand new to New Yorkers. To provide interested stakeholders and members of the public with accessible, impartial information and opportunities for engagement on specific topics of interest, NYSERDA is hosting this educational webinar series called Learning from the Experts to connect the public with independent experts in key topics in offshore wind. We endeavor to select Learning from the Experts speakers based on their expertise, not necessarily for an alignment of opinions with NYSERDA, with NYSERDA or the State of New York. If you would like to suggest a topic or speaker for a future webinar, you can email us at offshorewind at nyserta.ny.gov or fill out a survey also available on our website, nyserta.ny.gov forward slash OSW dash webinar dash series. Please note that the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenters. Next slide, please. It is now my pleasure to introduce Jonathan Frazier and Jeff Stewart. Jonathan is a, uh, excuse me, Jonathan is a renewable energy specialist with the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement in the U.S. Department of Interior. He performs various duties, including plan review, program development, monitoring of offshore activity and enforcement, all in support of the BESI director. Previously, Jonathan has experience in oil and gas as a production inspector and inspection coordinator for the Bessie Gulf of Mexico region. He also served in the United States Coast Guard as a port state control examiner, pollution investigator and responder, and exercise coordinator. Jeff Stewart serves on the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement, or BESI, a renewable operations team, as a renewable energy specialist with a focus on safety management systems. Prior to joining Bessie, Jeff, Jeff worked um, at Helmrich and Payne, a drilling contractor for 15 years. He proudly served in the U.S. Navy as a communications officer and damage control assistant on the USS Nevada. Thank you. And now I'll hand things over to our speakers. I think you're good. Hear me okay? You sound good. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jonathan Frazier for the first part of our presentation, and then I'll be passing over to my colleague, Jeff Stewart, uh, to round us out. S sound next slide, please. So to start off, as far as Bessie, who we are and what we do, uh, we have a couple of things to cover. Uh, first is who, uh, what we do. We ensure safe and environmental responsible operations for not only the oil and gas program, but now the renewable program on the Outer Continental Shelf. This comes from our original document, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act of 1953, but it's been updated by Congress uh, in, in various iterations throughout the years. Uh, we have several tools that we use to do this type of oversight. First, we have safety management system and enforcement, which we'll go into uh, further on in the presentation. Next, we look at industry standards. These industry standards are developed for industry by industry, and there's a whole group of industry experts that go into and really scrutinize how they should safely design and conduct operations for um, both oil and gas and traditional programs. And again, we'll talk about that in some further slides. 
For environmental compliance and stewardship, we work with our partners and other federal agencies such as NIMPS and, uh, and BOEM. We as Bessie have a whole suite of scientists from uh, benthic ecologists to marine biologists and so forth that understand all of these different uh, systems and the various laws and regulations and they work with their crown parts and the other federal agencies to ensure compliance with mitigation measures that are set forth by Bessie, or excuse me, by BOEM and NIMPS and those other agencies. For oil spill preparedness, we as Bessie have a specific division that goes over oil spill preparedness and response plans. And so that includes uh, the, you know, what is the total volume discharge that a uh, facility may encounter? What are the different mitigation steps and the equipment that a uh, lease is going to need to uh, effectively respond to a type of oil spill? And then also uh, conducting and designing drills and exercises that the leaseholder has to adhere to. We as Bessie have approximately 850 employees across the United States, but we're truly a national agency. We've got folks located in Alaska all the way over to the Atlantic in the Virginia area. So we are truly a national organization. Um, with that being said, as far as the general framework of the OCS Lands Act and our uh, various uh, standards and enforcement actions that we look to, we still have a lot of working relationships that go beyond the regulation that we use um, in order to ensure oversight. So one is MOUs. We have a lot of MOUs, not only with the United States Coast Guard, but also with uh, BOEM, our, our main counterpart, as well as the EPA and other federal agencies. We have a performance-based oversight, which Jeff will talk about a little bit further on in the presentation, but really, essentially, we as best here are setting an expectation of their performance level, and it's not prescriptive. It's meant to be an expectation of how you conduct your business and, and what level of risk occurs. Next, we have our, our risk analyst committees. So these are within BSEE. We take a look at all the various inputs, meaning performance over a quarterly, uh, monthly, or an annual basis. And we take a look at the industry and really scrutinize and try to see where there's areas of opportunity for improvement. And this is how we drive improvement uh, from the industry, either with engagement or consideration for update of regulations. For safety alerts, uh, this is something that we use to identify trends it, within industry, sometimes it's case based. We're looking at a specific incident that occurred. Other times we may see a trend and figure out that there uh, may be some areas of improvement for operations. And so we'll send out a safety alert describing uh, the issue that we find at hand and ways to try to mitigate those efforts from affecting future operations. Next, we have the Bessie Safe Text Messaging System. Uh, this is something that was established a couple of years ago by our previous director, and it's actually been very, very successful. Um, anybody within industry or any other stakeholder can sign up to receive these text messaging systems. And this is our main vehicle for issuing safety alerts. And so if we decide that there's a safety alert we want to issue, we'll go through all of our approval process internally to do that. We will put it on our website, but then we'll also send out a text notification system. And so uh, to date, I want to say we've issued over half a million texts and we have an in industry in the traditional oil and gas program, um, well over uh, several thousand employees who are maybe working on the deck or they're in management or in leadership of these organizations and they all receive this text notification. So that way these safety alerts are spread out very wide across the organization stakeholders. For engagement, uh, we have a lot of engagement not only with the, the stakeholders, but also uh, various uh, non-governmental organization as well as the standards bodies that I mentioned earlier on in the presentation. And then finally, for research, we actually have annual budgets for research. Uh, some of that we do with the uh, Department of Energy, other ones we, we do within BSEE, and then we'll commission third parties to do evaluation of research, various risk topics that we want to be evaluated or areas where either us as a bureau or the industry can improve. Next slide, please, Sal. So for BSEE obligations, I really personally think about this in really three pillars. So for us, we have the safety, environment, and then obstruction to other users, and those are all directly out of the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act. And so we as Bessie uh, use these three pillars as the baseline performance of expectation, but we certainly do believe that you know, all of these uh, operators need to adhere above that when it comes to you know, their performance with other stakeholders, other users of the OCS, and then their employees and their families. Next slide, please. So uh, a significant change for us as Bessie with in January of this year was we published what was Department of Interior published what's called the split rule. And so the renewable program has been under our sister agency, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management for a number of years. 
uh, since 2009, as a matter of fact. This year, even though we've been participating with uh, BOEM since the beginning, we officially divided the program into two sections, which I'll talk about further. But essentially, BOEM does all the leasing. They do the uh, site assessment and construction operation plan review and evaluation, which we participate in. But then everything else that comes to operations and enforcement, that's where our duties and responsibilities really step into our traditional role, like we've done for the oil and gas program for a number of years. And so in January this year, that officially split the regulations, and we are now directly cited as part of that 30 CFR 285 regulations. Um, on our website, there is a notice to lessee that explains that div division, and there's also various presentations that can be accessed by either our website or BOEM's website to talk more about the split rule. Next slide, please. So what we're going to be stepping you through today was actually something this uh, this uh, kind of timeline was developed to describe the split rule and the various roles and responsibilities. And so Jeff and I are going to be stepping through really just Bessie's responsibilities um, throughout the life of the project. But if you can look down on the bottom left hand side, you'll see in green it says BOEM roles and responsibilities. As I talked about before, that comes into identifying the initial lease areas, conducting the lease, and so forth. And then you see where the transition begins for us as Bessie in the light blue is when they start actually conducting uh, site assessment activities and go all the way through operations to decommissioning. Next slide, please, Sal. So I'm gonna cover one page of common terms and I'll be passing off to Jeff to cover a little bit more and then we'll step you through again this timeline chart. So for uh, two main terms that we're gonna be talking about, they're very, very pivotal in our uh, perspective as far as Bessie and, and where our design reviews really begin is after the construction operations phase, the leaseholders are gonna be providing us very specific design reports and these facility design reports include everything into you know, the final materials, uh, making sure that the design of the equipment and facilities are fit for purpose, meaning this harsh environment of the, the outer continental shelf. And then they also are gonna be providing us with fabrication insulation reports. So part of our regulation is that we do require a third party to go out while these folks are uh, actually you know, welding the, the uh, towers together and doing all the various fabrication. And we receive various reports from the third party about how that fabrication has gone, make sure that there's being audits of proper uh, welding, testing, and, and qualification of folks doing that type of work for the, uh, the actual building of the equipment. And then we also received the installation reports, and this is how all the way from taking that uh, d new design tower, unloading it to a ship, transporting it to the location where it's gonna be installed, and then installing that equipment, make sure that's done safely, again, to not damage the equipment, and make sure that it can last the life of the project, which could be upwards of 20 years. So I'm gonna now pass it over to Jeff to continue on the presentation. All right, well, thank you, Jonathan. And uh, I, I do wanna say thank you to, to Cheryl and Iserta for the invitation to come and uh, talk today and, and discuss uh, what Bessie does, uh, what, our, what our mission is, uh, and, and some of the roles we're playing now in, in offshore wind, as Jonathan mentioned, with uh, the split role uh, now in effect, uh, it, it, right, it didn't, change or add any new regulations. It did just split existing uh, regulations uh, to give us uh, authority over our traditional uh, sphere. So if you could go to the next slide, uh, we're gonna define two more quick terms, uh, which are safety management systems and emergency response procedures. Uh, so as, as Cheryl mentioned in my introduction, uh, this is my main focus is on safety management systems. Uh, so a, a quick definition would be a set of interrelated or interacting elements of an organization to establish policies and objectives and processes to achieve safety objectives. Uh, so if you're familiar with a quality management system or an environmental management system, uh, this is the same thing, just to focus on achieving safety objectives uh, for an organization. Uh, as part of a safety management system uh, within the, the regulations, it does call out emergency response procedures. Uh, and again, these would be plans that are prepared to respond uh, to emergencies and then to mitigate consequences uh, if, if we're not able to, uh, to control them through uh, the, the safety management system. So again, we're gonna start walking through uh, the, the kind of timeline of the project uh, as Jonathan shared uh, briefly. So if you can go to the next slide, we will start with the first kind of phase. Well, actually we're gonna start with, with all activities. So something that you'll see consistent across the, the phase of, that Bessie is involved in from site, as site assessment through operations and decommissioning, 
uh, we're gonna receive these different things. So we'll receive annual compliance certifications. Uh, we will receive and review incident reports. Uh, and on top of that, we have the potential that we will conduct our own investigation into an incident. Uh, we perform compliance verification activities, which could include inspections occurring offshore uh, and then uh, enforcement action. So something that uh, nobody always likes to uh, to talk about, but it is in our name of the Bureau of Safety and Environmental Enforcement. So enforcement is part of what we do. And at the kind of end of, uh, of today, we're going to talk a little bit uh, about our enforcement options and Jonathan will be covering that. So as we go into the, the next slide, please, uh, where we'll start talking about site assessment. Uh, again, these are kind of the highlights of, of where you're going to see if, if you remember earlier where you saw kind of the, the green versus blue of, of shifting from Bohm to Bessie. This is where Bessie starts our interaction uh, again as part of the, the SAP and GAP. So the site assessment plan or general activities plan as those are submitted to Bohm, uh, we do provide feedback as requested. Uh, specifically focus on, on the safety environmental impacts of those plans. Uh, we'll receive notice, notices from leases within 30 days of completing installation. Uh, and then the real big one that we're spending a lot of time on right now is overseeing the decommissioning of facilities used for site assessment. Uh, there's a couple different ways uh, that's referenced in the regulations. Uh, Med Ocean Towers is what kind of was initially envisioned of how that would take place. Uh, with technology and some other things happening, we've seen more and more use of buoys to gather that site assessment information, uh, which is great, but those do still fall under the decommissioning uh, requirements. And so that is submitted, uh, the decommissioning application is submitted to Bessie, not BOEM. Uh, obviously, we're gonna still partner with our sister agency, BOEM, to, to go through those, but that is something that you would be involved uh, with Bessie as you go through uh, that a site assessment. So again, you, you'll start seeing. We'll we'll start small here, uh, and as the project progresses through uh, its timeline, you'll see more and more involvement. So if we can go to the next uh, phase, which is going to be uh, the construction and operations plan, also called the COP. Uh, so again, the COP is found in BOEM regulations of what's required to be in there. Uh, we are actively engaged uh, with BOEM. Uh, to add our areas of expertise to the COP. There are several areas post split rule that now will come directly to BESI for our review and final approval. Uh, that would include uh, the certif certified verification agent or CVA, the nomination that the operator will send to us of who they're nominating as their CVA, as well as the scope of work of what the CVA is covering. Uh, and as Jonathan mentioned, that the CVA plays an important role uh, in the fabrication and also in reviewing the engineering design work uh, of the operator. And we'll discuss a little bit more about that later, uh, but that does, this is where the CVA starts uh, their involvement is in, in this phase. Uh, the SMS is also something that will be submitted to Bessie for our review. Uh, at this point, it's more of a description of an SMS than something that has to be fully finalized. Uh, understanding that operations are not commencing at this point, uh, this is still a plan of what they propose to do. Uh, and so it's important that there's a description uh, that it's clear that the risks are identified, the general risks, and that there's a, a system in place uh, to manage safety. Uh, the same thing for the oil spill response plan. Again, uh, you don't necessarily need to have the, the phone number of the company you would call if there is a spill, uh, but understanding that if there's a spill in this phase, that there is a plan that would be needed to identify who you would call to address a uh, spill. So it's more general. There's not as many specific details, but again, it is understanding that there's a, a path forward and a good foundation for the operator as they move from the planning phase into the next phase, which would be actual construction and installation. Uh, the, the final involvement we have, and this is more uh, directly Bessie and Bohm interaction, uh, is with the terms and conditions. And so as BOEM goes through their process of approving the COP, issuing their record of decision uh, based on the COP with the NEPA analysis and all their requirements, uh, there are terms and conditions that are also attached to that final approval if it is given. Uh, those terms and conditions are often enforced by BESI once we get actually into the, the installation and operations phase. Uh, and so we're heavily involved uh, again with, with BOEM to understand what's in those terms and conditions and that uh, we worked 
to uh, to create a good solution uh, for us to be able to enforce uh, those terms as we move forward into the project. So this is a, obviously a big major milestone uh, to date. There's been two projects that have completed the, the COP approval for Vineyard Wind and South Fork Wind. Uh, very excited to, uh, to have those two, and we know there's a bunch more uh, coming down, getting closer to that record of decision that will be made by BOEM. And this is also the last major piece that, that BOEM has final authority on. Uh, again, as you saw, there's not a, a brick wall that ends it. Uh, BOEM will continue to be involved. This is kind of their last big regulatory requirement before most of the requirements will move to BESI. So if we can go to the next slide, uh, we'll talk about the fabrication and installation uh, of these wind farms. So this is kind of where these two uh, projects that I mentioned earlier, where we're at right now, we're very excited to see steel actually going in the water, uh, hopefully as we speak. We, the first couple of uh, foundations and monopiles uh, have been placed, and so we're, we're very excited uh, to see that happening. Uh, again, as we go through these design, fabrication, installation phases, uh, this is primarily Bessie's responsibility and under our regulations. Uh, so again, we talked about the CVA uh, denomination earlier, and now we're seeing the CVA fabrication reports, the installation reports. So. Were they fabricated according to plans? Are they meeting the best practices? When they install them, are they going to install them according to their plans? Uh, we'll also see the FDR FIRs. This is a massive amount of information uh, that is often submitted to, to Bessie as we go through uh, to review their design reports and then their plan to fabricate and install these facilities offshore. Uh, part of that is an object or non object. It's a little different language, but that is the kind of the terminology that's that is used uh, right now in the regs. Uh, is Bessie will either object or non object. Uh, there is a, a 60 day time frame for that review to be complete once uh, Bessie determines that the information that has been submitted is complete. And there's a lot of engagement and interaction between Bessie and the operators, Bessie and the CBA, uh, Bessie and any contractors uh, who are going to be doing the installation work. Uh, during these reviews, uh, there's a lot of gates, uh, time gates that are put in. So uh, there's kind of constant communication. It, it's not just uh, waiting here after 60 days. Uh, there, there's again a lot of back and forth to understand that uh, we want we want to ensure that the designs are safe and adequate, and that it will function as designed. Obviously, a big part of that uh, is is being done safely, and that it'll be installed safely, uh, and so. As we move from that COP stage again of that description of here's how we think we're going to do safety and to actually I have a functioning safety management system that's in place and is working uh, and will help keep workers and the environment uh, safe. Uh, so there'll be functionality reviews again to make sure that system is working. Uh, similar to an OSRP again that you should have the numbers at this point of if we are going to call what the plans are, what companies are using. Uh, that level of detail would be expected. Uh, at this stage, so this we've obviously this is kind of where we've been at currently in the industry. So we've been spending a lot of time here, uh, but we also understand that this is a, a brief window in the overall life cycle of a project. And so as we move uh, into operations, if we can go to the next slide, we understand this is where we're going to spend the next 20, 25 years of a project. Uh, and if there's repowering involved, it could be 50 years for a project uh, for this op operations. Oversight. So this is a very key part of, of what we're setting up uh, to do. Uh, obviously, we want to see that safety management systems again are functioning, that they're being maintained and implemented. Uh, same thing for the oil spill response plan. Uh, we talked about earlier the emergency response plan that as part of the SMS will be a key thing that we want to make sure is active. We're engaging partners such as the Coast Guard when we're talking about emergency response or oil spills. Uh, understanding that there's review of modifications to the project, if there's repairs that have to be made, all those uh, are reviewed, uh, sent and reviewed by Bessie. Uh, and then again, kind of what we talked about earlier with inspections, uh, there's also requirements for operators to conduct self inspection. So we will review those plans and review the reports and the, the outcomes of those self inspections. Uh, again, as well as doing our own uh, inspections to, to verify it and do some spot checks uh, on those activities. Uh, but but this is going to be obviously where the majority of our time uh, will be spent, even though it seems uh, seems far off. We, we are getting close to, to starting that on our first two projects and we are we're excited to be there. So 
Uh, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jonathan one to make sure I, I didn't miss anything that he wanted to cover for operations. Um, and uh, appreciate uh, look forward to the questions uh, that we'll have coming. Hey, thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. So, just add a little bit more color to 2, 2 aspects of this 1 for the oil spill response plan. We have what they call government initiated exercises or GUIs. Um, it's an awful acronym, but <laughs> us, the EPA and Coast Guard use them, but these are actually. Uh, oil spill response plans that are, are divine, designed and developed by the respective federal agency. And then we have the ability to go to an operator and say, hey, we actually have a, a scenario we want you to play out and require them to conduct that scenario without advance notice. Um, so it's pretty stringent. It's something I was able to participate in both within the Coast Guard as well as Bessie. Um, and it's a great part of our program to make sure these folks are kind of kept on their toes for any type of oil spill uh, emergency response plan. Another thing I want to point out specifically for oil spill response is that I know that um, in the past there have been cables that had dielectric fluid as part of the cable design, but these for offshore wind, we're only seeing solid state cables, meaning there is no dielectric fluid in them. The only uh, dielectric and other oils that we're seeing would be on the offshore substation itself or a much smaller amount on the turbines. So very different than some of the traditional technology you guys may have seen in the past in the New York area. Um, and then finally, just for the self inspection plans and reports, you know, these, these turbines and the offshore substation, et cetera, are very, very high automated systems. They have a lot of real time capabilities and we're certainly planning as a regulator to leverage that capability and, uh, and look at the reports that the operator is doing to make sure that their facilities are in good, um, staying in good integrity. So Sal, next slide, please. Uh, decommissioning, so Jeff did a great job talking about decommissioning, and we are doing a lot of decommissioning oversight for the, the uh, Met Ocean buoys and that kind of thing right now. But at the very end of the program, at the very end of the life cycle for these respective turbines, when they go to decommissioning, um, we would still have the oversight, and it gets a little bit more involved. But this is something that we as Bessie have done for a number of years, particularly in the Gulf of Mexico. We oversee decommissioning of oil and gas platforms and plugging of wells on a regular basis. Um, so, you know, we would be the ones overseeing receiving that decommissioning application, they would discuss uh, what they want to do, how they want to do the decommissioning, and we would be the ones approving that as well as uh, being the lead NEPA agency. When you see the term uh, site clearance verification, so this is to make sure that they removed all the equipment out of uh, their respective areas. So we would make them cut the, the bottom of the towers off, but no below the mud line, so that way it's not going to be obstruction to other users of the outcome shelf or fishermen or any, any other users as well as make sure that they recovered all of their, their equipment they left on the bottom, such as the cables, et cetera. Um, and then, like Jeff had highlighted, the safety management system is absolutely integral to any of these, uh, these projects and these operations. The safety management system for decommissioning is very serious. There's the use of a lot of heavy equipment and, and industrial cutting, cutting and heavy lifts, et cetera. So it would be a very integral part of our responsibilities during decommissioning to ensure that that's done safely. Next slide, please, Sal. Uh, for the enforcement options, so we have what's termed in our uh, in our regulations as a notice of noncompliance. This means it's a violation. So, with a, a violation, if we find that there needs to be an enforcement action taken, this would be our first thing that we turn to. Now, with the notice of noncompliance, we have various levels that we could issue. Um, some things could be as simply as, you know, we need to document there was a, a shortfall or a violation, and there was a warning, but it's already been corrected all the way to other things that we may actually say, hey, there's a violation and you need to stop operations on that respective aspect of your facility or that operation until you can make these various uh, corrective requirements and then you could continue on with your, your operations once you've satisfied our needs. Uh, for civil penalties, just like other federal agencies, you know, civil penalties are assessed on a daily basis. So that would be if there's a violation, we would go from the start date of that violation, how long that occurred, and then that civil penalty would be assessed based on that. Um, that is just for the fine aspect of a civil penalty, but you also have what are called aggravating and mitigating factors. And these civil penalty cases need to take into account, you know, things that may be a shortfall of what they did wrong, but also things that they maybe did have in place and figure out where those gaps are. And then that would be assessed to come up with your initial, or excuse me, your finalized uh, civil penalty amount based on the daily amount, how long that occurred. And then again, aggravating and mitigating factors. Uh, cessation order again, this is something directly out of the regulations. It's sort of a tool in the tool bag. 
Um, this would require the ceasing of all activities on the lease. So, however large that lease is, if we issued a cessation order, we have the ability to stop all activities on the lease until those needs are satisfied. Um, there are some caveats to that, but that's generally how that process would work. Uh, when you have uh, a lease suspension, this would really uh, be designed to comply with judicial decrees. So, um, we do see in the oil and gas program, which we have a lot of experience with, sometimes these folks will get into various uh, judicial uh, issues going on with the court. And in order to satisfy some of these court obligations, we would issue a, a lease suspension. Again, another tool in the tool bag, not something that we'd really anticipate using on a regular basis. And then finally, the, the uh, quote largest enforcement action that we have available to us is to recommend to the uh, Secretary of the Department of Interior for revocation of the lease, which means to, to take the lease back. Um, you know, that being said, again, this is really a tool and tool back for uh, what we have to as enforcement tools, but not something that we would really anticipate using on, on a even an infrequent basis, but just something we have available to us as the regulator. Uh, next slide, please. So here's our contact information. Um, we'll leave this up for uh, a couple minutes in case anybody wants to jot down our uh, email information. You can reach myself or Jeff at the, the emails provided. And then we also have just quick links to our respective websites of uh, Bessie and Baum. So uh, yeah, next slide is just to thank you guys. We really appreciate your time and we're happy to go to questions um, once we give you guys a minute to write down our email addresses. Thank you so much, Jonathan and Jeff, for all of that great information. Um, I always learn so much during these during these learning from the experts webinars. So, a uh, reminder to our, um, our our participants and viewers to please use the Q and A button to submit your questions for our presenters at this time. We have a few that have come in, um, so we'll get right to them here. Um, there are a couple of clarifying questions, so maybe we'll just do those first because that can help uh, contextually. Um, a question came in that said, uh, what SMS are you speaking about? Is it ISM, ISO 9000, ISO 14000? I'd elaborate there, but I don't quite know what that means. Is uh, hopefully uh, that makes Jessica, sense to you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, it does. Uh, so the, the, the renewable energy regulations are written as performance-based. Uh, and so there is not uh, one specific SMS standard that's called out that's required to be used. Uh, we have certainly encouraged operators to select uh, a standard uh, to, to, to base their SMS around to build that up as a framework. Uh, typically what we've seen to this point is, is ISO 45001. Uh, it has been the primary one. We've seen some use of uh, American Petroleum Institute standard API RP75. Uh, that is actually specifically called out uh, in a, the BSE renew or the, in the SE's oil and gas SEMS regulations it does call out the use of RP75, uh, but there's not a specific uh, SMS standard that required that is required to be used. Uh, we do encourage again that an operator or contractor that you've adopted a uh, safety management standard uh, to build around. Great, thank you. Um, another clarifying question. You speak about cable and pipeline standards. What standards are you referencing? So for, for cables and pipelines and those types of things, when we talk about uh, their design, that's based on how they're engineered and then they're working with the respective CVAs to identify which standards are appropriate for the environment. Um, so again, we don't have standards incorporated by reference. If we were to do that, that is, uh, Consider a significant change and or update to the regulation, which would also be required to have public comment. A couple of things that we're noticing, you know, when we look at the design of these wind turbines, they've grown in scale over over a number of years. And so, um, right now, the industry certainly has to have due diligence and a lot of due diligence to uh, design these things to the respective environment and the size of equipment that they want. But um, if we were to pull the standards into the regulations again, that would certainly um, be very, very different than uh, what we're seeing industry leaning into trying to get to scale with these different uh, facilities and installations. 
Great, and and I guess we'll stay on cables and pipelines for a minute. Another question came in uh, that is asking a little bit more on the procedure, I suppose. Uh, the question is, how will Bessie inspect cables and pipelines? Will it be episodic, random, scheduled, et cetera? So uh, when we talk about inspection for pipelines and, and cables, really it would just be cables right now. Um, we don't have anything that would, is a pipeline application, but when it, it talks about cables, there's remote monitoring technology that these folks are going to have to uh, measure temperature sensing along the cable to make sure that it's staying buried uh, beneath that area. But then there's also requirements that we put into the terms and conditions. Um, these terms and conditions are actually on Bohm's website. Any lease that has issued a cop, so Vineyard Wind and South Fork, you can go and look at those. They're open and available to the public. Um, and we will require that those folks go out on a regular basis and assess their scour protection, which is the rocks and things like that, that they protect that cable transitioning from the bottom to uh, to the respective tower or equipment, and then uh, regular surveys of those cable corridors. So that would be a lot of it is remote operated vehicle purpose. Great, thank yeah, you. Go ahead. And one thing just to address about the terms and conditions, obviously we, we kind of mentioned those as, as those are developed, uh, right? So there are the terms and conditions of the two approved projects that, that are publicly available on the BOEM website. Uh, the, the item I would add is, is that those were the first two. Uh, and so as we've gone through and actually uh, tried to follow the terms and conditions um, and, and learned, you know, we're, we're willing to learn too and understand maybe where uh, things weren't as precise as we needed them to be, or maybe they were too narrow, you know, so we, we're learning. So I would say those would be a good baseline. I would say that those are, are subject to change. So don't assume that just because it's in there once means it will be in there uh, for, for future projects, but that, that does provide a good rough outline of, again, what we have approved and what Bo's approved at this point, but those might uh, change over time. Thank you, that's great. Um, this is a question that I see a few times and folks are, uh, I think, just interested generally, um, if you have any uh, thing to add to this, do you know the, the use, you mentioned, um, you know, the use of um, lubricants, oils, and things like that in, in some of these turbines um, and uh, spill mitigations, et cetera. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on your knowledge of the use of oil in offshore wind structures? So, I mean, yeah, very generally, right? So, um, you certainly, you have dielectric fluids that which are going to be in the offshore substations and the transformers while while that's being conducted. You do have some um, dielectric fluid that's inside the turbines, but a lot of that is more like gear oil and those types of things, just rotating bearings, but not near the volume. The volume you're seeing is really at the offshore substation um, for the dielectric fluid in the transformer aspect of it. But um, you know, they they do use some other oils and, and chemicals in these turbines, but not of volume, not of things that would not be covered by the significant volume and the spill response mitigation measures that you have to have from that large volume at the offshore substation, if that makes sense. I think it does. I think that's a, a, a point of um, uh, curiosity for a lot of folks um, in understanding the operations phase of these. So appreciate, yeah. appreciate that information. You know, I can just add one more uh, caveat to that too. This yeah. is the working relationship when you come to offshore operations is you also have vessels. The vessels are required under U.S. Coast Guard for their oil spill response plans and those types of medications too. So, um, so there is coverage not just for the offshore fixed facilities that we're talking about, but also the lease activities related to the vessels. They have to have oil spill response plans in case the vessel were to say sink or there was a spill from a vessel. That's great. I was wondering um, if we, I, the, a few questions came in on enforcement um, and wondering a little bit more about the environmental enforcement piece. Um, you mentioned um, uh, cessation order and a few other tools that you have in your toolbox there, but wondering if um, you, your agency gets real involved in some of the um, specifics that would be um, um, required by NIMFS or um, um, BOEM or others as far as um, um, perhaps curtailment for birds and bats, that kind of thing. What level of environmental enforcement do you have other than the, the oil piece that we've mentioned here? Yeah, so I mean, the, the environmental tools, you know, I'm, I'm not an environmental person, but there's a there's whole suite of tools. They have the same access that we do as far as the notice of noncompliance. As an example, that's it, it, we have different term in our oil and gas program, but that's what you would see generally issued. And so if you were to take any type of um, violation, NIMPS has direct 
you know, enforcement authorities under their regulations. Ours is really that relationship in between Boehm and Bessie and that that partnership that we have. And that's where our enforcement comes in is that Boehm is the one setting the expectation for the mitigation measures. If that expectation is not met, that's where Bessie comes in and we conduct the enforcement of uh, setting them back into compliance. And so an example of what we would traditionally see is if there was, say, a loss of survey equipment, right? That could be an instruction to another user of the OCS in our environmental compliance group has also done an evaluation to see, okay, is that an entanglement issue for uh, for a species or fishermen, for example? And so we can issue a notice of non-compliance to recover that equipment, as well as look at their safety management system. How are you performing that operation? And how are you gonna, gonna try to repeat that issue again? Great, thanks so much. Um, I have another clarifying question that came in about CBAs. Um, uh, who certifies the CBA? This is a, sort of a multi-part question. Um, who certifies the CBA? Uh, does a formal standard of acceptance exist to designate a CBA? Um, and are the CBAs standardized by an NGO? So Jonathan, I, I can try to take this one from, from my knowledge is there's not a, an NGO that is uh, certifying CVAs that is part of the nomination process is to demonstrate uh, which company you are nominated as your CVA has you know sufficient uh, capabilities and experience uh, to act as uh, as a certified verification agent uh, there, there's not a current uh, you know process that they go through to be qualified outside of, of the review by by Bessie I'm sure that you're aware of something else but I, I don't believe that's the case. No, no, you'd run it out great, Jeff. I mean, the only other thing that who we are seeing are classification societies, which is the term that's used in the maritime community. And so a classification society like Dinos Veritas, um, ABS, and, and those types of folks are the ones that are, are being nominated as CBAs because they not only have the technical expertise to understand fatigue loading analysis and things like that, but also they regularly do the fabrication verification. They go into a shipyard and they're used to looking at welding procedures and execution of that. So they really do have that parallel expertise and they're coming into the renewable space for the design of the turbines and the substations. Great. Thank you for that uh, clarification and, and description. Appreciate it. Um, so moving on to another question here, uh, what is GAP used for general activity, activity permit versus a SAP or a COP? Yeah, so the, the general activities plan uh, is for what I've seen them so far is more the research leases. Uh, so it's been less uh, specific on a full suite that, that you would need for a full uh, project for, for wind farm uh, for utility scale. Uh, so we, we've seen them more for that. Some other, um, and, and there's, Jonathan, I think there's a couple other gaps that were approved before I joined the team. And I, I've heard of them, but I don't remember what the details were. So I'll let Jonathan maybe. Yeah, so the one in my mind right now is actually off of Block Island where they have the, the turbines offshore that are in state waters. There's a, a gap that's actually for the cable because the cable goes into federal waters and then goes back into the state waters in that transition from the island to the land. And so there's a gap for that specific project. Great, thanks so much. Um, moving on to another one here, um, somebody commented, thank you for the great presentation. So I wanted to provide that feedback. How is Bessie thinking about scaling up the monitoring and enforcement for the many offshore wind turbines that are anticipated? So, um, you know, we did talk a little bit about the amount of automation that's within these turbines and these systems. One thing that's very different in my mind, just compared to the traditional oil and gas program is that a lot of these, you know, I think the analogy I use is it's more like regula regulating a fleet of vehicles, like a Honda Accord, right? And you're regulating 100 of those. Well, turbines are the same way. In, in other words, that on this lease, we're only seeing one turbine designed for that entire lease area. In the oil and gas program, you have customization. They're designing the wells, the processing equipment, all that to what they're going to be experiencing in the reservoir. So, and that world is very different. Here, we really think about this as fleet management, you know? It's not just how this turbine is doing, how are all of your turbines across your wind lease area doing? Um, so as far as scaling up, a lot of it in my mind is gonna be using that automated system and looking at how they're evaluating all their turbines in that lease area. Um, and then the other kind of nice thing we have 
compared to the oil and gas program is they're really going to have campaign seasons for maintenance activities. Um, that's something they're required to provide to us as, as well. Let us going to have uh, upcoming. And so we're going to really be have a pulse on the situation versus the oil and gas program where they're doing maintenance every day. And, you know, even if we went offshore, you're not what you're running into, not sure what you're running into here. It's a lot more uh, planned maintenance systems. And that being said, we're hiring. Um, we're, we're trying to get, uh, you know, understanding there, there's a lot coming our way. Uh, so we, we are definitely hiring. Uh, we also understand you know, everyone in the industry is, is hiring and trying to find those, those same people we are. So, uh, we, we are uh, definitely looking for folks to join our team. Uh, that is something we're, we're, we're trying to grow the team quickly because there's a lot coming our way. Thanks so much. Um, so another sort of operational or procedural question here. Um, given the scale and various locations of wind farm structures, how does Bessie plan to execute site visits for audits, GUIEs, et cetera? There is a follow-up question to that, more about the auditing um, and reporting of how many um, sites are visited, um, excuse me, are visited. Is there a guideline on uh, percentages of, of audits and, and so forth? So a little bit description of, of that procedure would be appreciated, thanks. I think that's that's more yours. Okay, um, so when we think about you know some of these inspection plans, right, and, and performance verification, you have to look at the size of these turbines and the way that they're going to be coming online. For example, yes, we are having South Fork and Vineyard when they're going to be installed, but they're very different sizes. South Fork is only Vineyard when is like sixty-two, right? So it would make sense that they probably aren't going to be looking in the same vein for that aspect. Um, from the simple logistical standpoint, we'd be going out there by vessel. In the traditional oil and gas program, we have so many facilities out there that we, um, and the ability to land, that we actually take helicopters to go offshore and, and land on those facilities on a daily basis. Um, they're also much older. You know, a lot of, it's not untypical when I was in the oil and gas program to land on a 40, 50, 60 year old facility. And so with these, again, with the high automation, um, a lot of it, we're going to have the ability to do remote monitoring evaluations. So, you know, when there's nobody on the turbine, we really have to ask ourselves, what's the value and what's the risk of going out there to a turbine that's automated and no one's on? Um, and what are the capabilities remotely to do those types of inspections? And then as far as the, you know, the frequency, that's really going to be a lot, uh, it's going to be performance based, based on the, the data based on uh, the evaluations and the maintenance that they're performing and what type of issues they're seeing during the maintenance would certainly help us drive our presence in the offshore space. Thanks. A follow-up to that was, um, is the developer required to provide mode of transportation? So you mentioned helicopters. Is that mm -hmm. on the developer to provide? So we would be transferred by vessel and um, we would ask for assist. They are required to facilitate that, but we also have to reimburse them for that. So. Um, it's not, it's not a free ride on us. We've certainly, you know, there's vehicles that we use for those types of logistical issues, but again, same thing that we do in our oil and gas program, a little bit different with helicopters, but yes, we reimburse them for those logistical assistance. Okay, great. Thanks for the clarification. Um, can you please describe near miss reporting requirements? So near miss reporting requirements, I'm actually probably going to kick to Jeff a little bit more, but that's one of those things that's more of a continuous improvement for your safety management system. We have actual incident reporting requirements that are very prescriptive. If, if you had a fire, if you had an injury with lost time work, so, so on and so forth, you do have to report those. But the near miss the vehicle for that is safety management system, self-evaluation, and then um, continuous improvement. Yeah, so, you know, when you start talking near misses again, again, there's, there's the. Kind of required list of, of what's required to be reported uh, to Bessie. Uh, you know, what, one of the things we've done and tried to encourage with the, the operators who are. Have operations going um, on offshore now is, is to share what's going on. Uh, whether those are uh, potential informal uh, contacts uh, with us, just let us know what's going on. And again, what, what they've seen, what they've experienced. Um, as Jonathan mentioned, right, is the, you know, the, the good foundation of a safety management system is continual improvement. Uh, so that's understanding, you know, fixing the things that, that you identify uh, that can get better. Uh, and hopefully you can learn from near misses rather than from actual 
incidents where, where people get hurt. So, uh, you know, we're certainly looking to have that information shared with us uh, again to understand uh, what the risks are, what the uh, and what the issues that uh, you know they're seeing offshore. Uh, there are there some there are some uh, third party companies that or organizations that uh, do collect uh, near miss information from their members. Uh, I believe you know, so. One of the ones we've talked a lot uh, with is the G plus uh, organization. Uh, and actually, I think just today they announced uh, they released their information for 2022. Uh, you know, so those uh, kind of industry bodies that are just focused on safety uh, that they're, they're not trying to. There's, there's no kind of trade side. There's no politicking going on that side. They're just focused on safety uh, as another great way to share some of that information. And, and to help the industry get better as a whole. Yeah. Um, and just to round that out, so like Jeff said, they just did just publish a report today. The nice thing about it is when you think about the operators of these offshore wind facilities, you're getting a lot of the experience coming over from Europe. They're using that same experience and, and conducting operations over here. Um, but G plus has, I think, 14 countries that are are they're getting inputs from. So you're really truly seeing you know, worldwide what the issues are, and then they're establishing guidance to try to improve if there's issues there. Um, another uh, group that we spend a lot of time working with is also the International Marine Contractors Association. And so those folks are uh, specializing in uh, heavy in industry in the, in the offshore space, and they also have some near misreporting, and they have a great working relationship amongst G plus and IMCA. That's great. Um, we've had a, a couple questions come in about that European experience. So, uh, if, if you'll indulge me, another one in that regard. Um, are you allowed to use standards from those jurisdictions uh, for one equipment, for example, cables? European USA, I'm not sure what that uh, quite means with the question, but how would how would inspection work when dealing with multiple standards for one piece of equipment? Are we creating our own as sort of a learning machine as we're going on? Or how much are we using from those European experiences? I think that's what the the person is opposing here. Yeah, so, you know, so standards, you know, if you're going to get a similar answer when the, the question about safety management systems, right? Is that, and, and Jonathan mentioned right there, there's only one current uh, standard that's incorporated by reference into the regulations, and it's a very uh, technical, structural standard. Uh, you know, so those standards, uh, what what we've uh, expressed is we, we do have an expectation that you use a standard. Uh, that, that, that there are very good consensus based standards that are both in the US and obviously you know, a lot of the work for offshore wind has been performed uh, overseas in Europe. And so understanding they've got a lot of uh, experience in offshore wind standards and, and specific details that uh, might not be present in uh, maybe a US based standard. Uh, so what, what's important is that it's clearly identified what standard uh, is being used. And that's part of that CBA process, right? To verify that the design would meet the standard that's being selected. Uh, I think one of the issues we would have with cables that we'd want to be sure is addressed is how those would then tie in um, right into the the wider U.S. Elect electrical grid. Uh, and I'm not not an electrical engineer, so I'm getting quickly out of my depth, right? But understanding. Uh, you know, how that standard would interface with, you know, equipment at an onshore substation and then tying in against the grid. So it's, it's not that you couldn't use one. It's just make sure that there, you know, that any of those type issues are identified and addressed and those risks are controlled. Uh, but if it's a sufficient industry standard, uh, then there, there's, we would encourage you to, to use something that's going to provide safe operations. That's great. Thank you. Um, I think another clarifying question here. We've had a, a couple of different questions come in about um, Bessie's jurisdiction. Where does it end? Um, so a, a bunch of questions about uh, jurisdiction over onshore components of the project, such as substations and duct banks and cables, et cetera. So maybe you could just provide a little bit more clarification on um, the Bessie jurisdiction end and which agency perhaps takes over where your jurisdiction ends, depending on the case. Yeah, so I mean, just generally, you have jurisdiction for us. It's uh, three nautical miles. This is kind of hard and fast rule that changes a little bit in the Gulf of Mexico. Texas goes out a little bit further, but when state waters start and start, that's where our jurisdiction start and stops, and it goes all the way out to the exclusive economic zone, which is 200 nautical miles out. Um, when you talk about within state waters, 
that uh, generally would be the respective state itself. And then there could be exceptions when you talk um, more about Army Corps engineers and you know waterways in those areas, they would have the oversight of their respective aspects of that navigational area. That's great. Let's 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 go into that a little bit more. Um, as far as your your partnerships with other uh, federal agencies, um, there is a question that came in about uh, specifically: Are there MOUs uh, set up or memorandum memorandums of understanding between you and other agencies, um, or perhaps it's it's even a little bit more formal than that? So, hoping you could go into a little bit more of a description of your relationship and partnership with Army Corps of Engineers, for example, Coast Guard, DoD. DOE, uh, Department of Energy, et cetera. Yeah, so you know, one of the things that Jonathan mentioned right in the very first slide was was uh, the MOUs that, that we have, um, right? So obviously Coast Guard is, is a major player uh, for what we're doing offshore. Uh, BOEM is another one, obviously our sister agency that, that a lot of the collaboration uh, happens with. Uh, but, but you mentioned a lot of the great ones, right? U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, uh, we, we have worked with them. Obviously, we're doing, we have a contract for them to support us in, in some of the engineering work. Uh, when you get to uh, into state waters and onshore, uh, I, I don't know if we've signed any yet, Jonathan MOUs, uh, yeah, but we're, we're still having those, you know, those conversations. Uh, OSHA obviously becomes the, the primary safety uh, enforcer uh, when you get to onshore, right? Plus the, the, the state uh, OSHA. Type entities, uh, so so there's there's a lot of uh, different players uh, in this space, uh, and so that is something we're we're constantly reaching out to our other federal partners and state partners uh, to address. So, and Jonathan, I know you're working on a couple of the, the MOUs as well. Yeah, that's right. So I mean, you know, just a large relationship is at least the aspect I deal with most is Coast Guard, uh, second to bone. Um, but aside from that, we do already have some working relationship with, uh, with state regulators, as well as, you know, we're building those relationships with the, the regional OSHA um, regulators as well, just to make sure that we have good communication and, you know, expectations of these activities. Great. Thank you. Um, a couple of more specific questions, and then we'll, we'll finish up with um... A sort of forward looking question, if that's okay with you both. Um, question came in about, um, sorry, excuse me. Um, do the approved projects have a safety zone around the facility similar to an oil gas facility? Uh, exclusion zones or limited access for collision avoidance, et cetera. Now, I'll just add here that I know that there are no restrictions as far as um, use in the area, but wanted to know a little bit more from your perspective, particularly when it comes to operations and your inspections of what that looks like for you, perhaps when you are on site. So, I mean, when we're on site, no, we're not establishing a safety zone for our presence or anything like that, but that's honestly safety zones are really a Coast Guard question. Um, they have issued some, some publications lately, but I, I wouldn't be able to speak to that um, in depth. So. Well, similarly, then, perhaps this is a similar answer. Somebody asked, are lighting marking and sound signaling plans approved by Bessie or the Coast Guard? So those are uh, approved by BOEM. In, in the terms of conditions and in the comp. Uh, that being said, obviously there's heavy involvement from the Coast Guard uh, to understand their uh, their lighting and, and marking requirements. So, uh, BOEM is the official, is the one who officially issue those, but uh, there, there's a lot of input from the Coast Guard on what that needs to look like. Yeah. And then the marking, we obviously care about how you name these facilities because we're a user of that name for the next you know 25 plus years. So we also have conversations and how all that comes together for our purposes as well. Great. Um, well, in our remaining time, one more question for both of you. I'd like for each of you to answer if, if you don't mind. Um, what do you see, Jeff and Jonathan, what do you see as the biggest challenge in safety over the next two to five years? Jeff, uh, how about you go first? <laughs> no, good, good question. Yes, yeah, so there's, um... There's a lot of construction that will be happening in, in the next two to five years. Uh, and, and so as we uh, continue to use, I think, European uh, assets, uh, but as we continue, I think as we start to grow more domestic based uh, vessels, whether that's, uh, you know, the US like vessels, as we start to move in 
and understand how we kind of get a good good turnover between their knowledge and, and making sure that uh, the U.S. workforce is prepared to to safely do those same type of operations uh, is going to be very important as we move forward over the next couple of years as we transition. Jonathan, anything to add? I mean, honestly, I, I see the same way as Jeff, and and you know. To make sure everyone understands too, this is also something we're experiencing by um, a large retirement of experienced folks in our oil and gas program. We have the, some of the same similar issues where you have new folks that haven't been coming into the industry. They're coming for the first time and it's a larger portion than what we're used to um, with this, you know, getting getting Americans on board. Happy to have them, but we need to make sure that they're able to. It's a difficult timing, right? Of how do you employ somebody? Get them trained up and get them repetitive enough that they can do this job safely and then teach others um, as well as build at scale. So it's, it's a big challenge. Oh, some good insights there. Thank you both so much. Appreciate it. Uh, I think we'll end now. Uh, next slide. Great. Thanks, Sal. So thank you all for joining us for this Learning from the Expert, Experts webinar. A reminder that the webinar recording and presentation slides will be available on NYSERDA's website. Our next webinar in the series will also be presented by Jonathan and Jeff. On Thursday, June 29th, they will discuss worker safety in offshore wind. You can register for future webinars through our events page at wind.ny.gov. If you have requests for future topics you would like to hear about in this series, please email us at offshorewind at nyserta.ny.gov or fill out our Learning from the Experts survey posted on our website. Thank you, Jeff and Jonathan, and thank you all for joining today. See you next time. Thanks. Thank you.